This is the research papers competition. And my name is John Kendall, and I'm on the Sloan Research Papers team. And it is my pleasure to introduce Patrick Ward, who will be presenting Volume and Intensity are Important Training Related Factors in Injury Incidents in American Football Athletes. And the presentation will last 20 minutes. Afterwards, we'll have a five minute Q&A session. And during Q&A, please raise your hand and we will present a microphone to you. And now please join me in welcoming Patrick Ward. Thank you. Um, injury is an unfortunate consequence of playing sport, any sport, and American football is no different. And the injuries are well publicized. If by chance during the season you happen to open up your favorite sports webpage or your Twitter account, you're bound to see headlines such as these. Headlines talking about which players are sustaining injuries, the epidemic of hamstring injuries in the NFL. There's even Twitter accounts that'll give you a count of which teams have injuries or even uh, how many ACL injuries there have been throughout the season. And some articles have estimated that NFL franchises pay out around $200 million per year to players on injured reserves. So that's not even counting you know, the player who misses the odd injury here or there throughout the season. That's players who've had an injury so severe that the team has been forced to play some on injured reserve and effectively end the rest of their season. Aside from the monetary issue, uh, injuries also have the potential to influence the outcome of games. So if you don't have your best players on the field, uh, you may have a less chance of winning the game, which is a problem in American football where we play so few games. In the NFL, 16 game season in college football, anywhere from nine to 13, depending on the, uh, the conference that you play in. We know that American football is a very intense sport. And um, previous research has suggested that it carries with it the highest injury risk of any collegiate sport at the NCAA level. At the NFL level, research from Feely and colleagues um, have found that over 10 years worth of uh, NFL training camp data, the knee is the most frequently injured region of the body at 3.1 injuries per 1,000 athlete exposures, followed by the hip and the hamstring at 2.2 injuries per uh, 1,000 athlete exposures, where an athlete exposure is defined as one athlete getting injured in one game, or one athlete participating in one game or one training session. <clears throat> and when we talk about these injuries, it's important that we uh, classify them. And we can do so into two broad categories, contact and non. Contact injuries are what I frequently call uh, occupational hazard. They're stuff that happens in all sport. Players are going 100%. They collide with one another, and something breaks or something tears. The non-contact injuries are a little different. Those are the ones that you see when the athlete's running down the field and all of a sudden, for no reason, they pull up and they strain a hamstring or a calf. Or maybe while they're in the open field, they take a weird cut and they tear their ACL or, or blow out their Achilles. And these non-contact injuries are of particular interest to us because they're thought to be at least due in part to uh, training-related errors. So applying too much of a training load too soon where the athlete's not ready for it or doing a lot of training load for a long period of time where the athlete eventually breaks down, or maybe doing too little training load where the athlete now becomes deconditioned and una unable to tolerate the rigors or demands of their sport. And because of the issues with injury in sport, it's led the sports science community to attempt to predict such injuries. And over the past 10 years, we've seen a lot of papers in different sports, such as soccer and cricket, as well as collision-based sports like rugby and Australian football. And like all research studies, these papers have limitations. For example, some of the papers don't differentiate between contact and non-contact injuries. They simply make, it, simply make it binary. So whether the athlete got injured in a session or a game, yes or no. This is problematic for the reader because now you can't really understand if the injuries or the training load actually had anything to do with those injuries or if it was due to, say, one guy rolling up on another guy's leg and fracturing his fibula. Some of the studies don't differentiate between time loss and non-time loss, uh, which is a problem because for the reader, you don't know what the severity or the magnitude of the injuries are. Obviously, we're most interested in time loss injuries because those, the those are the ones that keep players out of games or keep players out of training. Uh, oftentimes, there's a lack of censoring. So frequently, if let's say an athlete goes out, completes maybe a, the first quarter of a session and sustains a an injury and has to be removed from that session. Um, oftentimes these, these uh, papers or the models that, the, that are generated from these papers don't censor the athletes in those sessions. So what happens is the model kicks out some weird outcome like 
really low training loads lead to high amounts of injuries. Um, so the way that this data gets coded on the back end and handled on the back end is really, really important. These papers often will frequently end with some sort of conclusion for the reader, like a threshold value for a coach to say, you know, if you train above X amount of training load, you have a Y amount increase in injuries. And while this may be useful, oftentimes the thresholds bounce around from paper to paper, even within the same sport. And a lot of this is just because these papers are dealing with small sample sizes, one team, and maybe only one to two years worth of data. And for the reader, it's really hard to understand what to take away from that for their, the context of their team or within their sport. Uh, oftentimes, these papers are less about predicting injury for the sport and more about being specific regarding injury for that team, specific to the way that coach prepares that team and those players. It's kind of like nutrition research where one week you might open up a magazine and read an article about how coffee or wine is good for you, and then the next week you open up another magazine and read about how coffee or wine is bad for you. It's really hard for the consumer to understand what's important there. And then finally, while prediction gets thrown around in the title of these papers frequently or in the body of, of the paper, um, these papers are very uh, often not predictive in nature. The model is never tested on unseen data to understand its predictive value. Rather, these are retrodictive papers. They're providing a historical account of how injuries took place, um, which isn't necessarily bad. I think it's still useful. But these limitations have led uh, scientists across the field to then ask the question, can we really predict injury? And this is a tweet from Luke Bourne, one of the uh, co-authors on this paper, that he posted about a uh, little over a year ago, where he says, sports science industry states, we predict injuries while the sports science research community proclaims injury prediction is actually hard and unresolved. And he gave a link to this paper here, which is David Carey's group out of Australia, where they built predictive models of training load and injury in Australian football, and then tested those models on unseen data, only to conclude that injury prediction models built using training load data from a single club showed poor ability to predict injuries when tested on previously unseen data, suggesting they are limited as daily decision tools for practitioners. And this is a really important conclusion going back to Luke's statement about the sports science industry because we can walk outside and meet with any technology company and the big thing that they'll tell us is take your data, dump it in, we'll be able to predict injury. But the people that are actually in the field collecting this data, who know how challenging this data is to get good data, to make it clean, to code it properly, are actually saying this is really hard and injury is multifactorial, which leads us to our research aim. Uh, we didn't want to, our research aim wasn't specific to trying to predict injuries prior to the session taking place, but more to identify the relationship between training load variables and non-contact time loss injury in American football. While prediction may be hard, uh, it is important to first start by giving practitioners an idea of associated risk and so that they can then go away and build appropriate training sessions that are logical and hopefully mitigate injury. Uh, and we hope to do so by accounting for some of the limitations that I previously described on the other slide. We monitored training load uh, using some inertial sensors contained in the unit you see here. And uh, we used a variety of different inertial sensor metrics. For example, we used some player load metrics, such as total player load which provides us with a continuous measure of accelerations taking place on the body on all vectors, so X, Y, and Z. And in research, this is frequently thought of as a total training, uh, a measure of total training activity because it's been sensitive to lots of different movements, but it's also been shown to have a really high correlation with locomotor activity, such as total distance run during training or, or during a game. Uh, in addition to that, we also used some player load effort bands, four of them with four different thresholds. These are different than the total player load because they're not providing this continuous measure of accelerations, but rather this discrete count of activities pl taking place within those, respective, um, within those respective thresholds. So for example, an athlete sprinting really aggressively or maybe chopping up their feet when they break down and try and decelerate and change directions. Uh, impacts are, as you would assume, physical contact and collisions with other players and three corresponding thresholds for that. And then inertial movement analysis, or IMA. Uh, we also had three uh, thresholds for that. And what, what IMA is, or what inertial movement analysis is, is it's uh, uh, a count of movements taking place in different movement directions. So forward, backward, right, left, and all the movements in between. And it takes the information from the accelerometer, the gyroscope, and the magnetometer, and produces this count of uh, activities taking place within those three different uh, threshold bands. And we think this may be a useful metric uh, within the sport of American football because if we were to just rely on something like GPS, which might tell us a lot about the guys on the outside, like defensive backs and wide receivers who produce a lot of locomotor activity, 
it fails to tell us a lot of information about the guys on the inside of the field, the guys in the trenches, such as your offensive and defensive linemen, because we know the reliability in these units begins to decrease when we start doing high intensity activities in small spaces, say below 20 meters. So, which is exactly what the guys in the trenches do. They move in very small spaces at high intensities and body up to each other and, and kind of push and tackle each other. And so we've, we've done some previous work on this, on these uh, uh, metrics. We've looked at um, uh, how they differentiate position groups during running and non-running activities during training. And we've done some proof of concept work such as this, where we looked at uh, activities uh, or exercises commonly performed for American football players. So that was a wide receiver, and he just ran a straight sprint and took a, a cut, so right or left very similar to uh, what they might do in training, a typical exercise, and again, something that might be more specific to uh, the sensitivity of player load, picking it up. For uh, inertial movement analysis, high intensity movements taking place in small spaces, these guys are doing the 510 5 Pro Agility, which about 300 some kids are gonna do next week at the NFL Combine. And then finally, exercises that help players improve their ability to uh, tackle. Uh, so like a collision-based exercise where they're gonna hit a sled and drive through it. So the analysis, uh, we evaluated data across a complete season uh, of, for one full season. So preseason all the way through the regular season. And we did so on 101 American football athletes. We were interested in non-contact non time loss injuries. So the definition that we adopted was any injury not occurring due to contact with another player and resulting in the player missing subsequent training sessions or games. And we were really stringent upon, uh, about this definition because we wanted to make sure that we were just talking about non-contact non -contact time loss injuries. So we had a medical professional who was also there during the diagnosis of all these injuries, code these injuries in a, uh, in a bespoke injury database so that we could have that done correctly. <clears throat> the training load variables were normalized to the duration of minutes per training session to tell us a little bit about the density of the training sessions. And then they were also standardized uh, to each position group. And the reason we did this was to just borrow some strength from the position group data to identify any potential risks uh, within those specific position groups based on the training loads uh, you know, imposed upon them during the session. Given that our previous research has shown different position groups have different ergonomic tasks that are specific to their, uh, specific to their uh, tactical requirements. In order to handle the limitation of censoring, what we did was any athlete that sustained an injury during a session and uh, was evaluated by a medical professional and deemed not able to continue that session was removed from the, their data was removed from that injury day so as not to pull or pull the, uh, the data down. <clears throat> we built four logistic regression models, one for each of the um, one for each of the different training load variables, and then a joint model, which combined all of the variables together. We fit these models iteratively, and then we compared them using Bayesian information criterion and out of sample likelihood. And the last part there is to try and uh, account for the limitation of testing the model on unseen data. Since we didn't have enough data to build a model and then test on, say, uh, a holdout group or something like that, uh, we basically used a concept like leave one out cross-validation to test this model. Uh, across the entire season, there were 29 non-contact injuries, as you can imagine, most of them being in the lower extremity, with the exception of an oblique in the linebackers group, which is kind of a typical injury for those guys who move side to side a lot, but also then move their torso in different directions to track a ball or track a, a, a receiver or a tight end during coverage. Uh, a low back strain, which is a pretty common injury in all sports and all human beings in general, and an elbow strain interestingly enough, in a defensive lineman. It was a guy who was actually trying to learn a new position, and so he was doing a lot of exercises and tasks that were unique to him during training, and he ended up straining his elbow extensors. <clears throat> the best model uh, for each of the model categories is presented here, so the player load model consisted of both total player load and player load very high. The IMA and impacts models consisted of all three of the uh, bands of activity, and then the joint model consisted of total player load player load low, and impacts high. And this model was found to be the most useful model for uh, explaining or having the highest association with injuries during American football training. When we look more specifically at this model, we see that player load, uh, total player load and impacts high had the highest increase risk of injury during American football training. And so this is useful just from the standpoint that 
Um, total player load, again, measuring total activity, tells us something about the volume of work that the players are performing. So when volume is really high, uh, there's a higher chance of injury during that session. And then impacts high is interesting because we didn't look at collision injuries in this paper. We only looked at non-contact injuries, but it appears that the intensity of the session relative to how much physicality is involved, players hitting each other, pushing each other, knocking each other down, etc., seems to also increase the risk of non-contact injuries. Uh, player load low was found to have a, uh, a decreased risk or decreased association with injury during a session. And this just makes sense because you can't have a session of high intensity and low intensity at the same time. So the inverse relationship is logical. Uh, we, we tried to include in all of these models uh, a position group as a categorical variable. And unfortunately, uh, in, in none of the, the cases was it helpful at explaining injury any further, so, so we left it out. And probably we just need more data on that. Um, it, it, it's, it's possible that we just have too few injuries within each of the position groups relative to the amount ex of exposure for the players to really say something meaningful there. <clears throat> so some of the conclusions and, uh, and the limitations with the paper. Um, obviously, volume and intensity are important for people to know about uh, as they're training NFL athletes or college football athletes or high school football athletes, American football in general. And hopefully that information can be useful as understanding the risk factors for practitioners. And they can combine it with some, some of their sort of heuristics that they may have built over the years of developing training sessions for players, for athletes, and, uh, and build logical training sessions that hopefully reduce the risks of injury. Um, we need more data to really say something about injury within the position groups, and we need data, more data to say something about specific types of injuries. For example, it's quite possible that different types of movement activities increase the risk of hamstring injuries versus uh, adductor or groin strains. In this study, we combine them all together. Uh, one of the limitations of this paper is that we don't have any game load, so we know that lots of injuries frequently take place in games, and unfortunately, we don't have any game load to really uh, say anything substantial about what happens in the game, so that's a bit, uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, and then if we want to make this model truly predictive, instead of just starting with the risk factors, we need to incorporate a lot more information. So many of the papers that have been previously published uh, around this topic um, only look at training load factors and injury, and they try and make a prediction off of that. And I think we're probably really naive if we believe that it's only training load factors that increase the risk of non-contact injury. In reality, uh, injury and non-contact injury is, is really multifaceted. So there's lots of intrinsic factors that the athlete brings with them to the training session. There's extrinsic factors that are specific to that training session. And all the complex interactions between those two things probably are what expose the athlete most to, uh, to risk. Uh, additionally, how those interactions change over a season. So um, you know, as players adapt throughout the season, either positively or maladapt to all the training sessions and games and activity that took place before them, um, those interactions probably change, and, and we have to somehow account for that in order to make this truly predictive. So, uh, thanks so much, and thanks to my co-authors, uh, Michael Tegenvich, Sam Ranzen, Barry Dress, and Luke Bourne, who was really helpful on discussing the methodology of this paper and some of the ideas. <laughs> Uh, now it's time for Q&A, so do you have any questions? Thank you. Um, I guess I'm wondering if the issue is more data or random assignment of training. Um, I don't know if, if you can find a team that really wanted to split its squad up into, say, yeah. uh, low and high, but it seems to me that's the real problem here, um, and that training is probably endogenous to effort. So you could easily be picking up correlations because certain players are trying hard in practice and trying hard in games, yep. um, and you need random assignment to get around that one. Yeah, uh, random assignment would be helpful um, if you can find a coach that's willing to <laughs> do that. Um, I think that'd be a great way to study that. Uh, as far as effort goes, um, well, not a component of this paper. Um, like I said, we need other information as well. Uh, we do track like the players perceptions of effort as well. So that is something that we could incorporate into the model um, to understand the relationship between, say, their internal training loads and their external training loads, or perhaps their response to the prescribed training load. Um, but uh, we just, it wasn't, we didn't put it in this paper, but yeah, I agree. <laughs>
it, yeah, if you're if you want to look at the full picture, you also need the internal loads, so the heart rate um, loads, yep. time and zone. You also need the heart rate variability, recovery profiles, and you also need the hydration yep. data points and the a hip mobility asymmetry and um, yeah. pain and soreness plus the RPE stuff, yep. then you'll have the full picture. Yeah. The number of teams that collect all that data is pretty much zero. So Yeah, well, we, we collect all that data. Uh, I will disagree with you on the hip mobility piece, only because while I think it might be important, uh, no research has ever been able to suggest that specific um, joint ranges of motion or even postures lead to injury or pain. There's no correlation between those things. Now, you can find correlation in some papers that do this retrodictively. One thing I will say, though, is that if you simply measure hip mobility or posture or something like that at the preseason, uh, these athletes adapt and they change. So if there is a training intervention that changes that, somehow we'd have to account for that every week throughout the season to make sure that they're adapting, uh, which is possible to do. But with the number of, I mean, at, at a collegiate football team at 120 athletes, it's really <laughs> You yeah, need, it's, it's but, a, but you're, yeah. you're right. The collection of all of that information would be really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. It's tricky. And um, with the N of 1, from the going to the statistics perspective, you're looking at N of 1 for one particular type of injury. It's very difficult to do. So yeah. con congratulations on this really great work. It's really thank, a thank very so much. A big lift. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, if I remember your slides correctly, you had uh, 101 athletes listed, Yeah. 18 of whom were running backs. Um, did, I, did I have 18? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so most of those must have happened, or most, a large chunk must have happened in the early, prior, early part of the season prior Absolutely. to the roster reduction. Did you notice a difference between the athletes that made the final 53 and the ones that didn't? In terms of? In terms of overall loading like, or uh, performance. Like robustness of them or? robustness or just how much they exert themselves over the course of the practice. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, as you, as you correctly assume, most of these injuries take place in training camp. Very few, once you get into the season, I think you know, coaches intuitively understand that there's a game at the end of the week and we, we, we can't prepare as, you know, can't train as hard, can't prepare as hard because we know that, we, you know, we have to play at the end of the week. Um, as far as, like, the athletes that... Uh, make it down into the season, you know, I don't, it's, I, I don't think it's like necessarily that you notice as much, except for maybe like key starters where you tend to manage, you know, manage the health of your most valuable assets is the main thing. But it, it's, you know, for the most part, the effort is pretty similar across these guys. Um, you know, I haven't seen too many coaches that allow that to drift very much. So it, it is pretty consistent for these guys, yeah. And last question. Thanks for your talk. Um, you've been foc focusing on um, the non-contact injuries and yeah. the time loss injuries. Yeah. Did you also look at the medical attention problems? Because um, even if you don't have a time loss, but you do play with pain, I can imagine that is very relevant for the performance of the team. And it could also help you to increase the number of injuries in your analysis. Uh, and the second thing is for the contact injuries. Because even um, in those uh, injuries, you have theoretical models that assume that if you have accumulation of load, that could lead into, for example, a narrowing of the visual field. So there is a sort of assumption that even those injuries are relevant and related to load. Yeah, no, uh, I agree. And um, that is something we did look at uh, the medical attention piece. So we did also look at uh, some models using time loss and non-time loss injury. Um, one of the big limitations in sport, in pro sport in general, is the underreporting. Like players don't want to come off the field. Money's, you know, their contracts are dependent. You know, all of these things. So, uh, underreporting of like whether they have pain and things like that is is one of the most complex things in across collegiate and professional sports. So, capturing that is really hard. Um, as far as the contact injury piece. Uh, yeah, contact injury piece relative to uh, an overexertion of training load. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's probably something there. Um, I've tried to look at it in a few different ways, but I, I like 
I think there's something there, but it's like I'm trying to figure out the best way to make the connection to it, you know, because then there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, obviously, and stuff like that. But I do agree there's probably something there that we need to be aware of for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Patrick Ward.